Hey everyone, Ariel Adams here with Spending Time. I am joined by Zach and David from the blog to watch team and we are going to talk about being at SIJH 2019 and our top 10 watches of the show. Guys, uh, we've been back a few days. Any residual thoughts from the show? Uh, I can't shake the jet lag yet. It's uh, it's always so much worse coming home than it is being over there. <laughs> Zach is exhausted physically and mentally. David, how are you? Good. I'm, I close my eyes and I see watches, which is normal. <laughs> yeah, Having been to so normal. many SI church. Yeah, exactly. David is entirely unfaced. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, you do kind of get a watch hangover, though. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. true. And then a few days later, I miss the smell of new leather straps. <laughs> oh, that's so sad. So we chatted about the top ten list. I think people need to know, like, was it difficult? You know, was it ten obvious choices? Did you have like thirty watches and it was hard to boil it down? Was it hard to get ten? I'd say this I'd year say it, was it was not difficult for me to get to me. ten, but it would have been harder. It would have been hard to go too much further, uh, guys. There were definitely there were definitely some watches that we saw that we can't talk about yet that I think would have been noteworthy inclusions. Unfortunately, we still can't talk about them. I'm looking at some of the photos on my screen right now, um, and and they expanded the. I think that the hardest thing about this list is that just about everything on it is astronomically expensive, and 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 seeing anything under ten thousand dollars at the show is uh, a unique challenge in and of itself. And I think. Some of the stuff that we were able to see but couldn't show just yet could have made that list or at least uh, added to the honorable mentions and kind of helped uh, expand the, the budget range a little bit. Because otherwise, yeah. um, I mean, it's, I mean, between the between the Vacheron and the Hermes and uh, the HYT, I mean, you're, <laughs> you're looking at like a collective cost right there of... Uh, nearly two hundred thousand dollars. So, <laughs> yeah, um, people sometimes forget. You're absolutely right that 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 is a luxury watch show. That is not a mass market show. It's not an entry level show. It's designed as a luxury watch show. So, you know that we see um, watches that are even three or four thousand dollars is is quite rare. It's it's obviously there, but it's quite rare. Right. Yep. And the, um, but there were, I mean, to to be to to the credit of several brands, Mont Blanc and Balmain Mercier, um, there were some great options under, um, you know, at or around that price point. I mean, look, there there's not that many inexpensive watches there, but I I think we sometimes like, if it was the Basel level of three thousand dollar watches, we'd be even talking about the Clifton. I'm not sure that we would. Oh, if it was at Basel World, I think we would not know. Yeah, like th like Basel World has so many better options around that 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 range. Um, but my favorite watch of the show, at least something that I could conceive buying, was was under ten thousand dollars. But that was hard. You're right. Which it was is? like, well, it's on our list. It's not. It's probably number one on the list. Um, this isn't really an ordered list, but the Cartier, the Santos Chronograph, uh, Cartier is one of my favorite dial and case makers. I don't always get it perfect, but if you like dials and cases and hands and bracelets, which is what I care about in a watch mostly, they're among the companies that does a very good job. And last year they came out with a new Santos that was very popular for them. Um, it was a very over-engineered watch in, in the sense that the bracelet system like wasn't per se necessary, but cool. And they came out with a much larger version that has a chronograph and is thicker and comes on a rubber strap, which is a sporty Santos, which I've always thought was an amazing... like visual concept and I yeah. really like it and the all steel one looks looks pretty cool it's not for everyone I wouldn't call it the world's prettiest watch but it's a good it's a good statement watch for today it's very contemporary very contemporary that's true and it's refreshing for that because a lot of the stuff that we've seen is just not contemporary at all I yeah. couldn't say and there's the chronograph system which I think I don't care if you don't like how the watch looks you think that's cool yeah, the chronograph was extremely cool. Uh, it kind of it's kind of gimmicky to me. I mean, wh what what sort of actual like uti utilitarian purpose does that actually Dude, serve? It's all about I think it, the design. I think it makes it look really clean. I mean, yeah. you know, the the it it, it enables point. the watch to preserve the the signature crown guards at three o'clock. They don't have to mess with those at all. Honestly, that's my my it's least so favorite thing about many chronographs is that the pushers the pusher design can mess up the whole. Mm -hmm. Um, sort of the either the symmetry of the case, which obviously it'd be asymmetrical if you have pushes at three, but 
it, oftentimes they don't they don't fit the design language of the case itself. They're big and round, or they're rectangular, or whatever. I really like how they it kind of preserves the Santos look and feel um, while mm-hmm. adding the the function, which I think is pretty cool. And okay, I can I can give you guys that. It, it does look balanced for it. David, you're right. Strictly speaking, it's not utilitarian, but that's the last thing you should be thinking about for buying a Cartier. <laughs> uh, I guess that's right. No, actually, well. Yeah, it depends, but it does look more balanced for it, which I agree is a good thing. It I'm not a fan really of the, balanced. yeah, I'm not a fan of the reflective, you know, weird crystal on it. I'm just not sure that adds anything to it. You know, like, you, I struggle to hold it at any given angle where it wouldn't show like at least some reflectivity. But you can live with it in the sense it doesn't really hurt legibility. Well, I personally found it annoying. Um, you know, I guess <laughs> you're not a I'm... Santos man, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I like the Santas, just not this one that much. Look, look, I, you know, I have one of the older generation Santas, is the two tone one, which not everyone loves. I wear it. Some people think it's awesome. Other people, it's polarizing. I get it, but it's one of the few good looking square watches. These are hard to get. Yeah, that's true, and at least yeah, it's something it moves people. Yeah, and cool yeah. history to it too. Yeah, it's definitely cool history. Um, Okay, but Ariel, so let- I I, I, I want to ask real quick because I yeah. think you know I, I like I really like the chronograph, but to me the most exciting thing in the Cartier booth was the Noctembule, the uh, the blackout skeletonized version, hundred meter water resistant, uh, luminous bridges which form the numbers, super super cool piece, a little bit more expensive at around twenty k, um, but some so really really two- neat innovation from the line. That to me was the would have been the pick. Um, from, right, we we shot our... that one. So Cartier, sometimes uh, when people are talking about this here, they forget there's two new watches from them that are other Santoses. There's that one, which is an all-black skeletonized one with a black loom, and there is the blue dial of the, the Santos from last year uh, that's the, in the smaller size, but that has mm-hmm. the new loom sword hands, so not the blued hands. So I think people sometimes it, like aren't sure which one they're talking about. So you're talking about the skeletonized one, which is a cool one. Um... Look, it's a cool watch, but it's it's not like a daily wear watch, and I really get excited about watches that you can wear every single day for a year and be perfectly happy with. Yeah, exactly. That that is true, and I think I think to the to the discredit of a lot of skeletonized watches, the novelty of that can wear off relatively quickly, and I think the the chronograph is a much more uh, classic choice um, that I think you wouldn't get tired of in five or ten years. Yeah, I mean, uh, and and let's not forget on this on the Santos here. This is a big deal for people that wear Cartier watches. They actually have a push button deployant on the strap, which used to be like this awkward tension strap that was so archaic, and they like stubbornly didn't update. Am I the only one that hated those old Cartier straps? <laughs> Certainly <laughs> not, but the new ones aren't that great either. Hey, I hey, mean, I baby steps. <laughs> baby steps. You you can't just switch to a good clasp. That's not how it works. <laughs> <laughs> hey, bracelets are still cool, okay? They still do the bracelet. All right, that's what matters. This yeah, takes okay. years of marginal yeah, improvement. <laughs> okay, yeah. so let's move down on the list. Um, next one is the Hermes Le Heure de la Lune, the Hour of the Moon. Nice. Um, not everyone liked this one until they saw it. I thought it would be really nice looking immediately when I saw pictures. And when I saw it, the Aventurine dial and the, the gray-colored meteorite one, I mean, these were these were nice looking, and they're not like a hundred grand, twenty four thousand bucks. To me, it's like a budget MBNF in a way. We, you know, yeah. with it, with, it has like a little bit of legacy machine with those dials and hands, and you know, it's it's Jean Francois Mujan who developed it anyway. So it's it has that vibe to it for me. Now that I look at it, and it's twenty four thousand, not seventy four. I mean, you're right. Those mm-hmm. dials look like they come off a legacy machine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah, they really do. I I. Uh... Personally, for any it, honestly, I'm 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 always a little bit surprised that we don't see more of it on on more dials. But uh, Aventurine on any celestial themed watch is is I mean it's perfect. it's perfect. And and the, like the meteorite one is is cool, but in this particular like with the with the moon phase, the Aventurine feels like a stage. Like it it's feels beautiful. like a, an absolute backdrop for that complication. And that I mean that's that it's. Yeah, that was that was one of my favorite watches of the show to photograph, just because it's a dial that you can really get lost in. It's and a, I love it's meteorite. A great watch. 
That's a great um, watch. It's literally the only watch that Hermes came out with for men. There was a quartz watch. There was a new ladies' collection, which was nice, but also, you know, more fashion-oriented. Um, they still want to be taken seriously as a high-end watchmaker. So, you know, when they come out with stuff like this, it, it's good. Um, but I, but I know for a fact that they have not, like most of these companies, put a lot of emphasis in their watches. You know, this is a depressed economy for luxury watches. So. You know, well diversified luxury houses like our maze. It's like we're not making that many sales here. Let's put our resources elsewhere. Like we're gonna keep we're gonna stay, keep it alive. Um, but at the end of the day, like we're more we're gonna be a little bit more mass market with our focus. And I I think we've all seen that, right? So what are what are Hermes's long term plans with it? Do they plan on you know making more of these more often, or they just want to have these linger around as Halo product? I think Halo products is probably a big reason. I mean, so many of these fashion companies, like Ralph Lauren, for example, they get attracted to being watches, even though, like, no one there really thinks it's a good idea from a commercial perspective. It's got to be some type of emotional product. It's got to be, like, the ultimate thing for the for the Ralph Lauren lover, the Hermes lover to wear. Um, there are these people who are, like, obsessed with the lifestyle of these brands that, like, have all the stuff to have the watch, you know, to have a few of them, to have the really nice one. You know, it's a big deal. Plus, these are, are very attractive. I mean, most of the they brands are. do not put nearly as much time and effort in, in, into visual refinement. The French, mm. the, especially the Parisian-based uh, companies, which Cartier is one of them, you know, Van Cleef is another one, Chanel is another one. They make very well-refined, good-looking, and functional stuff. Few people do better than them. The Swiss sometimes get it right, but there's always something wrong with it. <laughs> that's actually true. <laughs> I got, so I that's got pretty nothing. hilarious. <laughs> Once you put it like that, it's, it's hilarious. <laughs> okay, moving on. Okay. Uh, next on the list is an HYT. This is the H1.0. Uh, which, again, they got to figure out their naming convention, so I apologize on that. So last year, you remember the uh, the HO? <laughs> the <laughs> H0? Yes, that's, the HYT ho. Like yeah. <laughs> um, that looked like this, and I think that a lot of people would mistake the H1.0 for it, but it's not. It's a totally different case, different crystal, different strap. Uh, it is the same movement, but it has a different dial and a lot of differences to it. They made this watch so much better with a dial that I think is cool in three versions that it's 49,000 bucks, but I'm telling you, like, in a lot of ways, this is kind of like a poor man's Richard meal, and it's got a little bit more conversational value right these days, if you ask me. I think there's a lot more conversational value in these things. They're, they're visually distinctive. You know, for me, it's always really, really important that a watch can add to the conversation, add to the general conversation of either horology or of, uh, you know, of, of style or design or whatever it might be. And I think, you know, Richard Mill certainly add to some components of that conversation, but I feel like it's gotten to a point where, I know this is a totally separate conversation in and of itself, but the Bon Bon collection to me added to the wrong type of conversation. I think when you get back to something like this HYT, um, I love how they've like essentially reverse engineered. I mean, this 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 movement is uh, Ariel. You can probably speak more directly to the movement, but I I seem to recall like earlier versions of HYTs uh, being powered by relatively simple movements that had just been completely reverse engineered to to do what they wanted them to do. Right? I mean, I think it's really really cool what's going on here. Well, this movement, you know, is, is is it's reworked here and there, but it's essentially the same mechanism that was originally developed for the brand when they came out with the H1 back in 2012. So that's why they called this the H0, because it was like going back to the beginning with like, if we had to start all over again, what would we do different? And so this would be like the new H2 in a sense, even though the H2 was something totally different. That's super cool. And it looks really, really wearable, too, like pretty short lug-to-lug -lug distance. Yeah, um, I can't yeah. really tell from your photo how tall this was. I didn't, I didn't try this. It's thinner than on, the previous one, I think. It's, that's it's, awesome. You know, it looks big because it's like a big sapphire dome, but it's actually, if you look at the size of my wrist, it's not like bigger than um, a lot of other watches. Yeah, I've worn the H0, and it was great. It was such a relief after, after all the large, chunky H2s and H3s and so on and so forth. It was like a, a genuinely wearable watch, and it was super comfortable. Very surprising, but it was very, very, very comfortable. Price has to still come down a little bit. I mean, it's 50 grand, so that's still... 
<laughs> insane amount of money but but uh, but hey and also i would love to see a little bit more color i, I always see these high-tech watches presented in black because black is mm-hmm. high-tech and whatever and I, I i wouldn't want to look at a black watch all day long you know for weeks and months it, it's like it, it makes me feel like i'm being you know deprived of something mm-hmm. speaking of and all I, black i i i, I agree well, I, yeah. I agree about the tech and about the aesthetic um but you know what one thing too david to your point about the price um you know, we've we've seen Ulysse Nardin, and I know we'll probably talk about this in a bit because I think it was also on the list, but we've seen Ulysse Nardin essentially make a budget version of the Freak. And I know it's it's an odd thing to say because it's still 20K, but it's 20K versus 80 or whatever. So, I mean, it's, it's a quarter of the price. Um, and I, I feel like they did that without diminishing the value of the top-end pieces. They were able to deliver an economical version of it that maintains the aesthetic of the expensive ones. But strips it down a little bit, and I would love to see more brands doing stuff like that, where they're able to, you know, essentially make a good, better, best paradigm within their collection. I don't feel like HYT has quite gotten there, but I would love to see a piece like this at fifteen or sixteen k, for example. Well, you know what I love about the brand is they hi- hired the ex creative guy at Victorinox, so <laughs> who had obviously other jobs, who's probably a better fit at HYT anyways, but mm-hmm. he has been redoing the collection. So the H0 came out before him, but this this is him. So and you know, when, I see when, good when, things when, coming. Yeah, and when, and when someone is a professional designer, not because he says so on the business card, you know, but because you know, he actually cares about good design and knows what, what makes good design and respects the basics that are, that are just simply need to be there you know, in, an, in any decent looking watch. You look at it, you look at one of their works, and you can just tell that you know it was it was one of those designers who worked on it. The proportions, the variability, the legibility, um, the, the you know the highlights. The proportions doesn't only mean size; it also means textures, colors, and so on. It, it's so much better to look at than something that is slapped together by engineers or marketing people or whatever. And and here I think it really shows. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Okay, so we're going to look out for HIT more, and um, mm-hmm. I think that this is an exciting thing for them. So next on the list is IWC Pilot's Watch Chronograph Top Gun, specifically the Ceritanium watch. Um, mm-hmm. I guess it merits talking about what is Ceritanium. So Ceritanium is a essentially an alloy of titanium and ceramic, and after the material is produced, it is then heated, and the exterior, um, what happens is something about the titanium molecules, they dissipate or go away, but the ceramic ones remain. And so it gets very, very hard and scratch resistant. So you have the lightness of titanium essentially with th- close to the hardness of ceramic in something that looks like metal. Uh, the downside is it can only be sandblasted at this point. Apparently you can't polish it, which... I don't know that I believe that, but that's what I heard, where some guy who was a materials expert there told me. So this is not really a fresh design, but it's a fresher material and a watch that has come back at a time that I think it's respected. Um, Guys, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think, um, to me, you know, when I first saw this watch, we we covered it, uh, you know, a number of weeks before SIHH with the advanced release info. This, to me, feels kind of like a return to form for IWC. The serotanium innovation is pretty cool. I mean, you, you essentially get the, the hardness of, of of titanium with the scratch resistant of ceramic. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. I mean, this is a watch that you can actually smack around a little bit. Um, it has, you know, in some of the... It's 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 honestly easier to tell apart in, in the press photos, the renderings, as opposed to the actual in-person shots, but has kind of a smoky effect uh, done to the crystal. So the, the, the watch itself has this like super, super matte um, aesthetic to it that has there's no glare, there's no reflectivity anywhere on it. It's really, really low key uh, and pretty badass. And it wears really, really well. Short lug to lug, it's not overly thick. It's one of IWC's, you know, best complications. The thing is, is like I, I saw a lot of watches in IWC's booth that I liked um, that I would probably buy before this one. But in terms of, um, you know, what is happening at the brand right now, this to me, I think, was the, the most exciting thing there. You know, and, and it's, I think it's also extremely, we, you know, we point this out in the article, it's extremely important to, to also make mention that 
um, the Kern legacy is effectively done as of this year. That's at SIHH. Last year with their releases, they had a few watches that were still, you know, under his purvey. But um, this year marks the first year where everything they've released is entirely under new management, essentially. And I think it really shows. Case sizes are smaller. Um, you know, the brand DNA seems like it's uh, making a return to form. And I think all these things are really, really good news for IWC fans. I mean, Kern was there since, what, 2002? I mean, we're talking a long legacy here. I think Kern does represent the Top Gun era, though. Yeah, I think it is. So he's he he will be alive and well at least in these Top Gun watches. For the next <laughs> this years. is mm-hmm. this is true. But I think <laughs> I mean this you know this this to me combines some of the elements of the mark though. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that is well, very. What good I place. like about these watches is that you can go to someone who wants a good tool watch, like a chef or like a cinematographer or some type of mechanic or engineer, like someone who isn't ready for a luxury watch but wants like a cool tool watch, and you can recommend one of these, and they'll be like, wow, this is a cool tool watch. And so it's really good that there's still products like that from, I'll just call them mainstream brands that you can recommend. Like, this is like the f- this is like a high-end Ford F-150. <laughs> you know, it's like a pickup this is the truck Raptor. watch. This is the Raptor right here. Right? It, yeah, I mean, there's high performance, yeah. but it's it's... Yeah. It's dead simple in terms of it's a functional watch. I mean, it's supposed to have like a military look. You know, you're supposed to be able to ride around and, and name your off-road, you know, SUV. Yeah, I don't get any of that vibe from this watch. Well, because you don't have a lot of those cars where you live, I think. <laughs> no, it's just you know, I look at this watch and it says ceramic on it in, to any extent. Honestly, IWC is yet to convince me about how well this material works. I don't think I don't look at it as a best of both worlds as opposed to more like a, a compromise or the worst of both worlds. Who who says this will not shatter just the same as ceramic shatters? I think it totally could just because it has a little bit of titanium in it, of molecules or whatever. I don't I don't I'm not I'll, buying that. I'll tell you where I, it's sensitive. Um, yeah. it, it will not shatter, but it will do something called um, it has the eggshell effect, where the base material, the titanium, is. Uh, softer than the ceramic. So if it dents really hard, you'll have an indentation because the underlying material, the substrate, is softer. So you'll have like an indentation. So the so top is there part an can underlying break. material now. Is, well, so is this coated? No, it's, it's not, not a coated, coated. But the, no, it's, it's the case. It's it's, it's oven baked. It's heat treated so that there's less titanium molecules on the surface. So the actual surface layer changes its material uh, construction. Right, That's so what the I top believe is, is basically happening. ceramic or ceramicized or whatever they ceramicized. call it. Ceramicized, there you go. Mm-hmm. The, the thing is, is like, you know, IWC is saying that this is, you know, this, uh, this is a new case for IWC. I think it's important to recognize this is not a new case. This isn't new technology. Um, Blanc Pond had a, a bathyscape, a 50 fathoms bathyscape from a number of years ago. I think Blanc Pond was, or, or, or JLC would have been the first, because JLC has the, what, the Cermet. Um, that's, that's I think, a slightly sea. different material. It, the Cermet is a little bit different, but it is a, it is a ceramic and a titanium AP, composition. AP used that as well. AP's done Some it as bevels, well. Yeah. But the, 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 the bathyscape, from my understanding was that the case is ceramic and titanium. It, it, it's not is not a coating. And I, sure, I from what I remember... but it was I, double the remember, price at least. It was double the price and extremely limited because apparently it was so difficult to make they discontinued it after only a few hundred units. So it's also yeah. one of the rarest Bathys caves um, they've ever made. So it's interesting yeah. to see that the IWC has either figured it out or this technology has evolved to a point where mass producing um, this particular piece is a viable thing. Now. This is viable. I mean, I ta- mm-hmm. again, they had this little lab there at SIHH and I talked to the guy about it. It's totally viable. I mean, again, there's a lot of materials out there that are viable, but the industry doesn't necessarily know how to use it, knows how to price it, and they're all scared. So there's like this long list of materials that can be turned into watches. I mean, look at Richard Mill. They choose stuff which is inherently non-luxury, but then no one else touches it. It's hilarious. You don't think it'd be impossible to come out with your own like TPT carbon case? No, it's totally doable. <laughs> totally doable. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's move on. Um, Panerai, the submersible Mike Horn edition. Um, you know, which is a watch that we actually all al- initially, at least I didn't really initially like in pictures, and then I, I, I wore it and I took a look at it. I'm like, this is the this is the first actually 
refreshed looking Panerai I think I've seen ever. It's certainly quite a departure from not just from other submersibles, but from any Luminor or Radio Mirror that we've we've seen in the past. I mean, it has this deeply etched one piece relief bezel. Um, as you pointed out, has a brand new handset, uh, has a brand new kind of dial aesthetic, uh, new loom properties, uh, new loom colors essentially. Um, and the markings on the dial are actually printed on the crystal, so it casts this kind of weird shadow into the dial when when photographed or viewed at certain angles. And I honestly, I think the biggest the biggest story with this piece is not um, it's not the the experience of going of buying this watch and going on the adventure with my corn, which is a totally different conversation. Um, I think the fact that this watch is made from recycled titanium and has a brand new, like fully recycled strap, to me, that's a pretty big story. I mean, nobody's done. I've been wondering how long it was going to take for a watch brand to make a fully recycled case, like a fully recycled alloy case. And I never would have guessed that Panerai was going to be the first brand. Can I be, to do that. Can I be the devil's advocate for a minute? Um, okay, I understand it's, it's titanium. How does that make it a better watch? Or recycled titanium? How does that make it a better watch? Oh, it doesn't. I mean, in all, in all, I mean, it, it's. That's not the for, point. It's not the point. Yeah, it's not. It's it's. To me, I mean, this is it's slacktivism. I mean, it, this is a watch. Yes, it's twenty k, but <laughs> you know, it's something that you purchase and like you feel better about it inherently because it's potentially the environmental impact is is lower. But it's not a. I mean, on paper, the 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 purpose of this is not to be better. Okay, I mean there is a there is a statement within there. Uh, look, I'm normally hyper skeptical to those types of stories because while I think they are cool, if you ask me, I don't think they're like they merit some of the prices. It's like here's like a fifty cent cool thing. We're gonna charge five thousand dollars for it. <laughs> and I'm just like you know, you had me at you're doing something different. You lost me at we're gonna charge you dearly for it. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I think recycled goods. You know, unless we're talking about the the basics, recycled plastic bottles or or cardboard boxes or what have you. I mean, uh, the 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 economy is certainly there with a lot of other products that use repurposed whatever um, outside the watch industry. Generally, are not more affordable than their mass-produced uh, non-sustainable uh, alternatives. Right, and right. I mean, that's just that's just the that's just the nature of how it goes, and I think that is why this is sort of like a, a feel good watch, essentially. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I, I think that the the assumption is that if something is recycled, it is either inherently cheaper or inherently better in some way, and I I, I don't think that's the case with either uh, cases here. It is interesting that um, you know they they they're harvesting the titanium from the aerospace industry, essentially, so you know recycled. Um, aerospace grade titanium but it, it comes to Panerai in exactly the same bar form as the the non-recycled titanium variant so i mean it, it's it's the same watch looks exactly the same they've given <laughs> it a different they've given it a different visual identity um there's virtually no added benefits to how it wears or what it looks like over a non-recycled variant but again it's just it's something that you look at and you can say hey this is recycled versus not so it's i i don't think that a few years from now we'll look at every 2019 that was a winner but i think there'll be enough yeah for sure I, I think what what we're gonna see more of is more more watches made from recycled Materials. I mean, I think if you look at the news, uh, <laughs> just follow what's going on in the environment. I think it would be irresponsible to think that that more brands wouldn't be getting on this train. I just, I, I would just say, I would just applaud Panerai for being the first. That's all I'm doing here. I think we should buy a watch that you get meat with it, but that will, <laughs> that's meat that will not be like regrown. So it's like you're taking a cow out of the environment, which which will not be replaced with another methane creating cow. That could be that would be a very interesting thing. You actually pay to make it so that people have less meat to eat. You know, um, it's hmm. kind of like buying something that you know. If you buy this, we'll plant a tree. We'll donate something. If you buy, this, it's like that, but <laughs> more relevant for today. <laughs> Moving on to repurpose meteorite. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, really Where's all this meteorite coming? I mean, I love meteorite, and some of it's gorgeous. And mm -hmm. I was told that there's not a lot of it, but it seems like the watch industry is just really, really cutting in the old meteorite stock. Like, what's like, what's? I, I want to know what like global reserves are at. 
I mean, they, you know, these are actually cheap. You can you can buy yeah. like a for like a couple bucks actually, and not yeah. that much more. Wait a minute, are you telling me the luxury watch brands are again overcharging me for material that's not inherently precious? <laughs> Is that what you're trying to tell me? <laughs> How do but I always get myself into this, you know? Out. You can put gold hour markers on it. I'm romance, but you know, there might be an entire ten dollar bill worth of gold there, okay? <laughs> I was I was I was reading the other day, I can't remember it was a wired article or something, just about how there's this incredible cottage industry of um essentially like like armchair astronomers who pay really, really close attention to these types of things and whenever there's a strike, like it, essentially there's a foot race to the impact zone so that the the materials can be harvested and then immediately sold. Well, that's interesting um, is that from a legal perspective, um, a lot of it is belongs to the person whose land it falls on. So it doesn't matter if people run there. So there's certain places in the world where it's still a free-for-all, but most places on the United States, for example, if something falls in your backyard from outer space, guess what? It's yours. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if someone comes on your property to get it. It's not theirs. Right. It's called These, stolen property. This particular story was referencing a lot of strikes that happen in Eastern Europe, which... Oh, yeah. So there's a, there's yeah. an awful lot. Of, you don't have much yeah, of the old yeah. rule of law out there. <laughs> Just what we need here. Lots Just of some land meteorite strikes. So uh, <laughs> we're talking about um, Eastern European meteorite in this beautiful Piaget. Highly likely. <laughs> Highly likely. Um, okay, so they took the Altiplano here. This is Was this the 40? Yeah, the 40 millimeter. It's got their ultra-thin automatic movement in there. It's gold, it's legible, it's got a gray meteorite dial, and it's like one of the most amazing tuxedo watches I've seen in a while. And it's just a Piaget Altiplano meteorite. What does this thing cost? Like $30,000? 24500 uh, yeah, Swiss francs. Yeah. Okay, look, it's it's still a Halo product, but I, I could be wrong. I don't think there's like a ton of these going on like uh, Chrono 24 right now for like half off. No, there's not. I, I, I think, honestly, I think that the premium of getting the meteorite dial is pretty significant. I think a regular... Without pulling up the website, I think a regular Altiplano, like a time-only Altiplano without a date wheel. We'll talk about that in a minute. Expensive. But it's this is a wafer of gold. Don't forget, this is a like wafer a, of gold. Like, it's, I mean, that's like an eight or a ten thousand dollar premium. I want to say. Um, now I should probably look it up God. before I. Uh, but so when, when we're talking it's a about huge Piaget, premium for the meteorite. Uh, Can you put a number on space, really? What do you guys What do you guys think about the date wheel, though? Like, why would you Why would you punch a hole in the meteorite? <laughs> um, it's it, it just looks wrong. It's all it, kinds it does. of wrong. It does. I mean, that should have been. There's there's ways they could have fixed that. They could have at least yeah. made that gray or something like that. Um, yeah, we mentioned that to them. You know, it it doesn't totally kill it for me because here's the thing: only another watch lover would say that. Anyone else is like, "Wow, yeah. that's really nice." Yeah, exactly. Uh, and it, yeah, so it's almost a ten thousand dollar premium over the standard white dialed white. Gold. Holy moly! Yeah, so that that's a thirty eight millimeter. No, this is the forty. So it's a but this is forty. Dress watch, huh? No date. White that's gold. That's a thing. White that's dial. a thing. They made it a little bit bigger. Ever okay, so slightly um, more gold. Washer and Constantine traditional twin B. We are running out of time, so we need to hurry up. David can't can't wait to Basel World 2019 top ten. You're already there. That's that's <laughs> true. Yeah, I can already tell it features two Rolexes, one of blah. <laughs> <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Ba- no Basel Meg ten is on it. its way for David. Um, no make on it. What this was a cool thing? watch. This was a really cool watch. You want to explain the system? I want to see why it's not as I, you know. I look at it and. and I kind of like it because it's small, relatively speaking, for all the complication and stuff. But the surface treatments and the dial and the case back were just not that great, to be mm-hmm. honest. I was looking I would, at it. I would like, love to know, see this with a you... solid dial, honestly. Yeah. No, I'm looking at my pictures, stuff. and the lighting in that area was bad, but the movement was dark gray finish, like almost like a uh, an NAC finishing. So it's like, you know dark which was cool you yes. rarely see that on a vacheron the dial had a combination of some actual guilloche. Um part of it was open the finishings were modern david is correct that it does not look like a lot of vacherons no but, that's not what i said my implication was that it's not as high quality as it should be not that it looks like whether or not it looks like other oh vacherons. okay i don't to- care whether or not it looks like other vacherons <laughs> i care about looking at a macro image not super macro just just regular stuff and i'm not you know overwhelmed by the the quality of the of course it's a prototype I don't prototype 
<laughs> yeah, next year we can exhibit too. You can, you know, we can just slap something together and call it a prototype, and that's you know we get away with it. Look, I I thought it was okay. Um, it, it's it's definitely something that in final form needs an enormous amount of like refinement. It's got to look perfect. It's got to look perfect. Yeah. Uh, but the movement has a system where if you push a button as the user, there's a switch on the dial that goes back and forth from five hertz to one point two hertz mode. And five hertz mode is what you should have it in when you're wearing it on your wrist and then when you put it down you can leave it down up to 65 days on 1.2 hertz mode so 5 hertz gives you 4 days of total power reserve and then if you switch it into 1.2 hertz mode and there's this really cool power reserve indicator that tells you both you, n you have up to 65 days for the perpetual calendar not to be reset and I just think it's such an interesting integration of user and watch. It's it's not the prettiest thing in the world, but it's just it it feels cool in a way that I haven't seen from a Vacheron maybe ever personally. Yeah. That's well, true. Um, not n not only is it a great integration though, I feel like that particular execution and that particular innovation is really really unique and tied specifically to the perpetual. I mean, a lot of these perpetual calendars say that they're accurate to, you know, for the next 200 years or whatever that is, but un unless you're, you know, you wear it for a day and then you put it down and then you wear it two months later and you got to set the whole damn thing again, like this to me makes a lot of sense for preserving sort of, the, I mean, are you going to keep it on a winder for 200 years? <laughs> yeah, most yeah. aren't even automatics. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I, I, I think I think it's not just an innovation, you know, a great innovation. I think it's a great, uh, it's a great complication to have with this particular um, execution being a perpetual. I think it's super cool. And what's so cool is just the, the clever way they did it. There's two different escapements and it's just you switch over from one to the other. And the funny thing is yeah. you probably lose time, right? Like that act of switching probably screws up the timing, but I'd rather reset the time every once in a while than have to reset a calendar. It's it's funny. It, it, this is an answer to a first word problem, of course. Um, and at the same time, I'm torn a little bit because it it tells you now you may now you have the option of not looking at your washroom for up to sixty five days. <laughs> you know, and when I look at it like that, it, it, it it's it's kind of weird. I would I would appreciate like a simple ten day power reserve, and then you know I'm like, okay, that's great. I mean, why would you want to be away from this watch for more than ten days? You wouldn't. You know, of course, if you're traveling or da da da, but you know, setting up a perpetual calendar, two hundred thousand dollar washer and constant, it isn't the most tedious or worrisome, you know, process that I could think of right now. So I it's, see it's not it for like people that like travel for business for a long time. You don't want to take this with you, so it's like you come but back it's like and you're like, set it up. It's you get back home and you fiddle with it. It's not like changing oil in a Ferrari. You know, it's not like a four hour <laughs> process that requires specialized tools. So it's an I, answer to a problem that should not be a problem even to the owners of the people. I understand, uh, owners of the watch, I understand the novelty factor of it. It's just, it sort of implies to me that, yeah, everything has already been done, so we did this. Well, you heard it from David. <laughs> I still think oh, well. it's cool. <laughs> okay. uh, you know what? A similar system that I really like is the Breguet 7077 that has also two balance wheels and one runs on a higher frequency than the other. Uh -huh. um, the chronograph? The chronograph. That's yeah. amazing. I love that. This is that reversed. Yeah. Okay, moving on. So uh, David David strikes the twin beat from the list. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, the Ulysses Narden Freak X. David, did you like this watch? I love it. <clears throat> ah, tell us about it. It only has one balance wheel, so I guess some people will be a little disappointed with it. And you can but... see it on the <laughs> dial. Yeah, but at least you can see it on the dial, uh, which is great. And it's twenty one thousand dollars, not forty nine or fifty or something like that. I was really surprised when they when they launched this. Um, I, 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 what's really weird is that it has the exact same size, and technically the case shape is exactly the same too as my Grand Seiko. So I'm wondering if I could just swap the movement or do something crazy like that. But uh, I guess uh, I'm not getting a freak anytime soon. <laughs> do you do you find it freaky enough? It's not colorful enough for me. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, yes. I was I was surprised at how I mean, w w with the exception of actually what's on the dial and and sort of the signature um, signature balance wheel being integrated there. I mean, it wears and looks like kind of a sporty dive watch without a bezel. I mean, the case has this kind of cool cushion shape to it. Um, has normal lugs. I mean, it has a crown. I mean, it looks otherwise like a normal 
watch, which I kind of love it for. But I, to your point, it's yeah, it's not very it's not very colorful or uh, or it doesn't it doesn't jump off the wrist the way the the, the other mm-hmm. freak does. I mean, I still I w- see it as a freak because of the way the dial looks, which I think is where they were aiming for. It's yeah. way more practical as a watch. I mean, the freak is is cool, but you have to like adjust the time in a weird way, and it's not as water resistant. It it looks awesome, yep. but this is way more actually practical and has that cool system where the you know the regulation system is on the dial and and moves around in a carousel like way. I was just going to say I like it all the better for the crown. You know, I think it, I think it's actually a better. It's a good thing, not a bad thing, that it is a crown and not that weird bezel and case back um, setting and winding system. So yeah, great watch. Just needs more colors. Uh, which they have other versions, right? So that's... I know, but they're still gonna bland a little bit. They will make you your own David version of the Freak X. I will reach out to you and. What will we call that? Freak the times freak David. <laughs> freak times <It's>... David. <laughs> freak by Here's... David. So if you want something that is the opposite of a freak, Mumble and Hair <laughs> is automatic. The least freaky watch at SIH 2019. It's, it's, it was not very freaky. Um, So this is, I guess this is one of the Davide Serrato collections. This is him not doing a sports watch. This Have looks like a before. 1940s era chronograph sports watch. So it it was a sports watch back then. And you know what I really liked about this is the the textures, the materials. Like this was so easy to screw up and we've seen this dial design done in horrible ways like they made it flat yeah. or they just made it crappy. Like he is good of a way as they could today, I guess. Like authentically reproduced an older dial and made it legible. Yeah. The hands are mm-hmm. the right size. It's shocking. I mean, we've seen this look done poorly so many times. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. You know, I think the the salmon the salmon dial in this and in the Minerva chronograph as well seem to be. And everybody's saying that salmon is you know the the latest trend sweeping the nation. He um, made rose gold. I, I, it 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 looks you know it it looks great. I think um, it's one of those watches that photographs really really well. It has a really interesting dial, but I think um, that color doesn't work with a lot of uh, shirt colors, skin tones. I, mean, I, I feel like that's a tough color to match. Um, it can look pink in some lighting. It can look more bronze in other lighting. So, Maybe it should be yeah. a little bit more faded, like yeah. uh, AP salmon. So yeah, a little bit more exactly. faded sometimes. I, I really, really love this color on paper, but I found um, in person, kind of depending on how it was photographed and uh, you know how much light we had um, reflected off the dial, you know, it was it it changed personality and maybe not in a good way. They had a similar dial execution um, in white. They had a GMT there that was super cool that had the same uh, twelve three six nine layout. Um, as well as like a day date version, um, both with white dials. I think for me personally, um, I like the salmon the best out of all of them. But the one that I would probably end up bringing home with me was more of a white, a safer white dial, unfortunately. Right. I mean, I think sam- that that kind of pink gold color, as I call it, that rose gold, is for people that want to have a little bit more visibility. There, it's not really meant to match because you're right. That's not a color that you you wear too much. Um, I like that for about 2,000 euros, you can get essentially the same dial um, materials and look as this one that has the the Minerva movement in it, which is 28,000. You know, the Minerva one is cool, but like, I'd want that watch at like 3,000. The Minerva right. movement's nice, but it's, you know, doesn't need to be there. You could have a more simple movement there, I'd be happy. So the right, three yeah. hand is like that's the watch to get in terms of value because it's like the same it's like the same thing I mean the movement's same different vibe. but it's the same vibe for much more reasonable price. Yeah, Sure yeah, Perigo Laureato absolute chronograph. Why is it called the absolute chronograph? Um, in what absolutely. way? Absolutely, absolutely. The Laureato is not new. This is the chronograph Laureato in a black coated titanium case that's just very comfortable. It, this it's, is larger now, right? It's 44 now? Yeah, it's 44. It's water resistance to 300 meters. It's 13,000 Swiss francs. Um, and it kind of has the vibe that you'd want from like somewhere between a high-end Breitling and a Royal Oak Offshore. It's somewhere between there. And it's actually priced somewhere between there as well. 
This watch confused me a little bit because uh, to me it harkens the, the 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 Gerard Perigo from five ten years ago when they were making a ton of these like really big, um, oddly proportioned sport watches. And to be fair, like the the aesthetic is a little bit polarizing, very like cool and masculine and and kind of overbuilt, which. I mean, it, it, given sort of the the history of GP, I, I feel like is a little bit incongruous to kind of who they've who they've been all this time. Um, so this watch to me felt a little bit like a step backwards for the Laurietto, which seemed like David and I have both reviewed different variants of the Laurietto. I loved the one that I spent time with, David. I think you had pretty good impressions of the one that you had as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, this feels a little bit like a step back for the Laurietto as a platform. Um, but to me, there was no denying how fun this watch was on the wrist. Like it wears really, really well. It feels super sporty. It, it's like the build quality is exceptional. I also really liked the World Time variant that was kicking around the booth a little bit. I think I didn't love like the 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 branding on the rubber strap. Um, Aerial to your point, it definitely looks very like Breitling with the oversized um, word marks on it, but. So this was this was a this was an interesting watch for me. So it was one, it was a lot of fun, but uh, two, it it didn't feel it doesn't it doesn't feel like the right direction for the brand still. But, I, but that could just be me. I mean, look, the brand has struggled to find out what that right direction is for a while now. Yeah, for sure. This is sure. a very good execution of a collection that I don't think they're going to get rid of. They need to have just sort of an everyday sports watch. They haven't had a good one for a while. The Laureato has persisted since the 70s. And I think one of the reasons people give it a hard time is they feel like it's trying to be a Royal Oak. If you do just get over that, it's a great watch. Yeah. It's a fantastic watch. I mean, I think this is probably the... This is less Royal Oak than the more the more vintage-looking Laurieto. It doesn't have the hobnail dial. I mean, it has the has a, a bezel, that a faceted, a multifaceted bezel, but, I mean, it's... Yeah. Yeah, it's I super really... Cool I feel like whoever says, oh, this is like a Royal Oak, they feel like, you know, th- those people say this if have known watches for like a couple of months and they, they want to really show off how well they know watches, but they have no idea what they're talking about. Yeah, Because I agree. if you knew what you were talking about, you would compare, you know, the Omega Constellation, the Engineer, the, uh, the, the Nautilus, and a bunch of other watches to the Royal Oak. Yes, the Royal Oak was first, get over it. It doesn't mean that it should be and must be the only octagonal watch in, in all of human history. I'm super happy it isn't, for one. And for two, the Laureato came a whole year, a little bit more than that, actually, before mm-hmm. yep. all the others. Yep. yep. So it was before the Nautilus. So why is it not saying, like, no one says, oh, the Nautilus is like a Laureato and a Royal Oak. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Ridiculous. Look, you know, when it comes to this type of, like, watch like justification people are very dogmatic about it they don't really think too much about how these things contradict um just go one last thing about the laureato there was that black and blue carbon glass concept watch there i thought was cool that one they said it's not quite ready for prime time in terms of the material but like that would be a sweet watch i would definitely wear that watch Mm -hmm. yeah same here and the cosmos was extremely cool as well i mean we, we didn't name it to the list but uh um, it was a little bit too niche, but super cool. Super niche, very. I mean, it was it was massive, but I mean, I feel like between the new Laureatos, the Cosmo, and the the, the glass carbon bit that you just mentioned, um, they brought they brought. I mean, GP had a pretty strong showing. I mean, they really did. Yeah, yeah. the black yeah, and was... blue case. I hope that happens sometime soon because it really did look very cool. Uh, okay, let's see what else is on the list here. Was Not that much. It? Yeah. So. Oh and my we god, that was ten already. Super long. So. Yeah, people only want our shows to be longer. So, you know, I and I, I like I like going long, and people like it. But I understand people got places to be. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's some watches that were shown to retailers at the show that we didn't get to see because the brands S I H H make it clear they want us to pay attention to them all year long, oh, which yes. means we just have to. <laughs> it's it's interesting that they should show us the watches there so we could photograph it. But they actually keep us in suspense as well. So in a sense, it's good. It's good to be surprised a little bit. Um, but the watch industry right now is still trying to figure out future direction. There's still things that are working. Again, I mean, l- look at what's persisted over the years. Sport watches have always been the most popular. It's always been kind of difficult but unfortunate to try to sell dress watches. High complication watches tend to be best when they're showy. Like, I think for the most part, like, not that much has changed in taste. Um, in the last 10 years or so. I agree. That's a very good point. 
Okay, any other final and, thoughts? Oh. And yet, so many struggle to get these watches right. So many brands. I mean, what you just said it could be the foundation, you know, for a new watch designer or a new collection. And yet, it's so many, so much of the time, it's all over the place. You got to keep them on their toes. Yep. Okay, everyone, thank you for listening to this episode of Spending Time. We went over the top 10 watches of SIJH 2019 according to Blog to Watch, and we'll see you next time. Bye.